Då ska vi fortsätta med det rykande aktuella brittiska exemplet Brexit. Och till vår hjälp har vi nu Ian Manners som är professor of political science at the University of Copenhagen. Nybliven, vad jag förstår, svensk medborgare Brexit. på grund av Brexit. Och ja, är vi inne? Har vi stängt av mobilerna? Yes, varsågod Ian Manners. Tack så mycket. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, lessons of Brexit for the Swedish debate um, and look at the three areas of the question of knowledge, the question of disinformation and the question of media. Um, I want to put this a little bit in the context of gendered relations within the debate and post-Brexit gendered relations. Uh, you cannot separate these four aspects of the debate. If you do, you won't understand why nothing that comes from Westminster makes no sense whatsoever. So I'm going to talk firstly about the rise of the far right uh, across the EU with a specific focus on Britain and Sweden. Um, I want to talk about how a lack of knowledge about the EU leaves uh, voters and citizens very vulnerable to particular disinformation and media lies, the types of disinformation we've seen, the types of media lies and how partiality and objectivity are highly problematic, what this means for the question of the uh, increasing rise of toxic masculinity within the Brexit debate and the way in which um, female politicians, female specialists and female academics are silenced by death threats and the way in which this says something about voices in Europe and the necessity to wake up to what is going on and what has been going on over the past uh, 12 years in the social media environment and the way this, be this has become a tool for the right and far right across Europe. Um, the first thing we see is the way in which uh, far right groups across Europe have connected together and networked since the 2004 European Parliament elections. This is a meeting, a notorious meeting, as I guess you know, um, presenting the award for direct democracy in Europe to uh, Nigel Farage, uh, former leader of UKIP. Um, but he is surrounded in the meeting uh, in the, uh, the Grand Hotel in Stockholm by other leaders of far-right groups across Europe. This is a, a new development. If there's one thing the far-right hate more than ordinary political parties, it's other far-right parties. Um, but what we've seen occur in the European Parliament during the lifetime of this European Parliament is a type of networking, connectivity and political influence um, that has become increasingly uh, real. In the case of Britain and Sweden, in the run into the last European Parliament elections, there was an expectation um, that the far-right Swedish Democrats would join the far-right National Front of Le Pen, Marine Le Pen. Um, what in fact happened was the Swedish Democrats joined the far-right UKIP party uh, in an attempt to ease their pariah status and more recently have moved to join um, the Conservative Party as the Conservative Party within the European Parliament has itself moved to the right. Um, this was the condition within the European Parliament at the last elections. Uh, what has happened is the, uh, the ECR group has become stronger with time and uh, Marine Le Pen's ENF group has become weaker. This will change quite radically in these elections as um, all four far-right groupings, and we need to include the NI as a far-right grouping in some weird way, will become stronger and yet weaker with the departure of the Conservative Party and UKIP within the ECR and uh, the EFDO. One of the things that's important to remember in the UK debate is you actually have three different types of right activism. Um, but in the Brexit debate, they've become importantly connected. One clearly is the far-right activism of Farage and the UKIP, uh, playing in particular the xenophobic anti-immigration card. One of the things that showed up in the Cambridge Analytica data, that the one discourse that really played well is to connect the EU with foreigners and immigrants. Um, and the meeting here of the Swedish Democrats and Marine Le Pen really demonstrates, I think, that this far-right discourse of anti-immigration within the context of the 2015 refugee crisis across Europe is the real trump card that we will see played over and over again 
Not what's the question in the European Parliament elections. The answer is immigration, please vote for me. Okay. The second aspect of this has been the increasing ultra-conservative nature, in particular of the uh, Conservative Party, which is now split, broadly speaking, between um, uh, the, the right wing of the party, uh, in particular those that want to take back control. The key feature of ultra-conservatism across the European debate is the back word. The future of conservatism is to look backwards. Make Britain great again. This is a constant feature of political debate. And of course, the wearing of traditional clothes um, is in effect a media portrayal of the nature of when Sweden and Britain were great again. Whether that was in the case of Britain, within the Commonwealth, uh, a code word for the empire, uh, the constant allusion to empire and return to empire is a component of this. The one thing that's currently different, although I'd argue the roots of this are now in Sweden, is that one part of the British Conservative Party, the British Brexit debate, is neo, if not ultra-liberal. Now, what is interesting is all three of these are deeply, deeply interconnected, and we need to be aware of this. Um, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, um, a financial trader, an investment uh, banker of some respect, uh, is today pushing the argument, although he has been defeated twice in the last two days in Parliament, um, that it's best to just leave. Uh, more money has been spent in the last week on this in social media advertisements within the UK than was, was spent within any one week during the referendum itself. So what lies behind this is an actual interconnectivity between the far right, the ultra conservative and the neoliberal. In Sweden you don't have yet this third component, but it is there and we need to be aware of it and so I'm going to try and wake that up a little bit. These slogans were tied together with the idea um, in particular, of neoliberalism, which would create new jobs with new trade deals, with uh, xenophobia based on immigration and foreign criminals, together with ultra-conservatism, um, in particular of protecting the NHS, which I guess you know is practically extinct with Brexit. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about how these three forces played out in the illegal referendum. Why is it illegal? Because the two major leave groups overspent, and one of them is under criminal investigation for receiving 8 million, that's 80 million kroner, or plus, from foreign external sources. Uh, a recent hearing in the Royal Court of Justice, the, uh, the counsel for Theresa May basically admitted as much, saying, we know it was illegal, but guess what? It wasn't actually a compulsory referendum. It was an advisory referendum, so it's not subject to the same laws. So it can't be declared illegal because it wasn't a legally binding referendum. And so the Prime Minister and pretty much everyone on the right and far right in the Parliament pursues the referendum as if it was legal. The main problem in the UK, and this is where you have to be, pay attention in Sweden, is the average level of knowledge amongst ordinary people, amongst journalists, amongst almost all of the people I've seen stood outside the Houses of Parliament these past three days, amongst everyone I've seen sat in studios in Britain over the last three years, uh, amongst 99% of the Houses of Parliament, there's an almost zero uh, level of awareness of the complexities of the EU. This, then, is the first of the three weaknesses that we need to be aware of. Um, the Eurobarometer survey asks an, a series of very basic objective questions, and these change over time, which is why I have two different graphs here. They include, is Switzerland a member of the EU? Yeah. If are members of the European Parliament directly elected? And, and, and it used to include the question, how many states are in the EU? Um, but it turned out most people seem to know that. So now it includes the question, uh, how many states are in the Eurozone? Um, over the last 15 years, on average, about 25 to 15 percent of British people can answer these questions. Now, the response I always get is, well, you may not know the details, but you at least know that the EU is a communist slash fascist enterprise. We know that anyway. We don't need to know the details, right? 
The secondary types of questioning ask simple questions in greater depth, and what they demonstrate is if only 15 to 25 percent of British citizens, and it's not particularly good across the EU, it has to be said, can answer these very simple questions. When it gets to the slightly more complicated ones, uh, there's almost zero, naught to five percent of knowledge, which is statistically uh, immaterial. This is the most recent survey, and it's got Sweden on it, so sorry about laying it on its side. From autumn 2017, three very simple questions. Sweden polls amongst the highest across the EU, about 28% 20, of Swedish respondents, uh, randomly selected but representative, seem to know three basic things about the EU. That's, in an EU term, pretty good. Um, but not good enough to save you, you from disinformation and media lies. The UK is amongst the lowest, despite two and a half, three years of constant campaigning and knowledge about the EU, it has slumped over the last two and a half years, from 25-27% to about 13% of ordinary citizens can answer three really basic questions. And this is terminal for democracy. There's no point in having a a vote in the House of Parliament, or another referendum, or even a debate on the BBC, because you're, you're basically talking nothing against nothing. Why do people know so little about the EU? I've got two explanations for this. One is that they are being systematically disinformed. Okay? Um, there's only one real journalist left in the UK, Carol Cadwallader. She's the only person really worth reading. And she has, over the last three years, tried to track down how the Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign, which links together two parties, Leave.eu, which is the ultra-conservatives within... Uh, sorry, which is the far-right UKIP representation, and Vote Leave, which is the ultra-conservatives. Ultra you can add to this a group called Labour Leave, which is the, um, the anti-European Labour members, they are all connected and they all exchange money, which is one of the reasons why they were deemed illegal transactions, uh, despite the fact that they also overpaid. What also this links together, and this is from DSMOC, which is a uh, climate science monitoring network, is that these are, in particular, networks of power connected through um, a series of PR groups based in London at 55 and 57 Tufton Street, which link together, for instance, uh, so-called think tanks like the Institute for Economic Affairs, Leave.eu, Vote Leave, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, which specifically disproves global warming science, the Atlantic Bridge, uh, which sponsors Liam Fox and connects together the, uh, the Trump um, regime with the British government. Uh, what these organisations do is provide funding for think tanks across Europe. In particular, we know from US tax returns that they provide support to UK right-wing think tanks such as, well, no surprise, the Arne Rand Centre, uh, such as Civitas, such as um, the Institute for Economic Affairs, the Legatum Institute, the leading scientific basis for the benefits of tr free trade is paid for by right-wing think tanks and taxpayers in the US. In Sweden, the Atlas Network of right-wing think tanks, largely sponsored in the US, supports Timbro, Ratio, and the Centrum for Red Vista. It is this component, represented in something called Epicenter, the misspelling of center should be the giveaway that this isn't a European but a US organization operating in Europe, demonstrates that we need to look out for the trick-trick of disinformation. For instance, the so-called uh, nanny state index. Uh, nanny means that the state spends too much time regulating your life, where organizations like the Institute of Economic Affairs and Timbro sponsor an annual survey of the, how unfree countries like Sweden and Britain are, and then trick this into the Swedish public debate in, uh, for instance, articles that have no reference to Timbro in them at all. And this is uh, the independent lead uh, liberal editorial, which doesn't mention where the data, where the story, it's a puff piece, where the funding or where the evidence comes from. And what's the legal purpose of this? The legal purpose of this is to justify free market policies across Europe, sponsored by largely free, mar free market think tanks in the US. The second component of this 
is it's not just the knowledge, the information, the disinformation that you need to be aware of. It's the media. And uh, in the past, I didn't frame it this way. I said, well, the, the media is a little bit imbalanced. Let's be honest about this. It's lies. And we need to understand why the media lies. This is media fed through social media from uh, Vote Leave, the official voice of the Conservative Party, Leave the EU. Okay. Now, remember, um, during the period of campaign, these were regulated. Um, you must leave the EU, otherwise you'll lose the NHS. You're going to lose the NHS by leaving the EU. You must leave the EU because on Friday, Turkey is joining the EU with 76 million people, and guess what? They're foreign. Uh, you must leave the EU because Obama said you mustn't. And guess what? He's foreign, and he's a person of colour. You must leave the EU because the EU protects, blocks our ability to protect polar bears. Yeah, if you want to save polar bears, leave the EU. You must leave the EU because that's the only way we can stop bullfighting in Spain. Right? You must leave the EU because otherwise we won't be able to drink tea. Now, we can laugh at this, right? but these are one of millions of fake media campaign components that are then puffed into, and we can hear them this week about the benefits of leaving the EU, of free trade under WTO rules. Actually, no country in the world trades today only under WTO rules. Um, who owns these sorts of lies, then? It's quite clear. There's only five sets of billionaires in Britain that own practically the entire media industry. And of those, 50% of it is owned by two people. Neither are resident in the UK, by the way. One's Jonathan Harmsworth, um, and the other's Rupert Murdoch. Uh, you will have seen, if you've been watching British TV, Andrew Neil sat there neutrally balancing the viewpoints in front of the Houses of Parliament. I don't know if you've been watching British TV. Andrew Neil was appointed by Rupert Murdoch to run the, the Sunday Times and is now the lead person balancing the debate for the BBC in front of the Houses of Parliament. How is it possible? Uh, the UK has an overwhelmingly right-wing wing press owned by foreign uh, located owners like the Times, the Telegraph, the Sun, the Daily Express, the Daily Mail, the last three of which are practically pornographic newspapers um, which not only preach far-right, far right, xenophobic, uh, anti-EU uh, stories, but they also systematically persecute women and female academics. I'll get to this in a second. What's funny, or not funny, is that nobody has a clue which of these are pro-EU or not pro-EU. Now, this is asking readers, is the Daily Mail pro-Brexit? Oh, might be, I don't know, 40%. Is it anti-Brexit? Yeah, it might also be, I don't know, you know. Is Sky pro or anti? Yes, 50-50. Yeah, Rupert Murdoch's very even on this. Um, is the BBC anti-Brexit or pro-Brexit? I'll get to this in a second. Well, it seems to be anti-Brexit, yeah? Because Andrew Neil, you know, is, he's a, quite a neutral guy and he knows a lot about the EU as well. He, we see this every night on TV. Um, the, the right wing of the media press in the UK constantly not just publish lies, but lies that lead to threats, violence, um, xenophobia, and misogyny. Yeah? It is not just about pursuing independently elected judges or uh, voted uh, members of parliament uh, telling you where they live, what their email addresses are, but it's practically encouraging you to, to track them down. Um, the BBC, you think, would help in this because it's a public service broadcaster. Its mandate is to educate, inform, and entertain. And yet it uh, addresses these questions the same way, in some respects, as I see on Swedish TV, which is, well, if there's two sides, Labour, or Labour and Conservative, you must have a balance. Yeah? If there's seven parties, you must have a balance. Yeah? So what you have is something called regulated equivocation, which is we, m we must have both sides, you know. Well, there's, there's, um, there's the question of pro-global warming, anti-global warming, you know. Um, 
the question of pro-EU, anti-EU, irrespective of it's almost impossible to find in certain policy areas anyone that could see the benefits of leaving the EU, for instance, for social services or for public health. Um, but this is precisely what's been going on. And this is precisely why most people seem a bit confused, if not entirely confused. The last thing, of course, you realise that any disinformation, media lies and, and far-right stories have to tell is to attack the one people who are publicly employed yet independent, okay? That is academics. And this is what, in, for instance, the Daily Mail has been very systematic about doing, which is identifying remainder universities, identifying academics within those universities, and pointing out how they're all lefties um, and though thus not worth reading about. How does this play out in the question of gendered relations? Increasingly and exceptionally toxic levels of masculinity have been exaggerated by this. Um, the bad boys of Brexit, the biography of how UKIP won the referendum, has the key word bad and boys. Okay? The top left-hand picture are the boys that brought this about and how delighted they are for doing this. All the major supporters, the billionaires, most of which are non-resident and non-taxable in the UK, are male. And all the leaders that want their country back, not your country back, are male. Okay? And now, what are the consequences of this? Obviously, poor old Jo, uh, jo Cox paid with her life when a Britain front, a far-right um, supporter, a Britain first supporter, uh, stabbed and killed her. Um, the very next day, uh, Aaron Banks and UKIP began pushing very, very hard messages about uh, the extent to which this means we need to leave the EU against an agreed uh, attempt to suspend, suspend uh, campaigning during that time. Since that time, organisations like Leave.eu, the online um, mouthpiece of uh, uh, UKIP, have systematically, and by the way, these, these are the nicest ones I could find, okay, pushed um, misogynistic, uh, racist stories, in particular about poor Diane Abbott, um, uh, about any woman in general, in this case about Emma Watson, and in particular identifying those Conservatives that quit the Conservative Party, saying things like, it's a very, very nasty place to be. Um, most female MPs in the British Parliament today feel that their lives are threatened and have moved home, uh, changed their patterns, hired security guards. Some of these patterns will need, need to be sustained for the rest of their political lives, if not the rest of their own lives. Um, and it's quite clear we're slowly waking up to this, the extent to Brexit itself represents an, a component of toxic masculinity, where slowly women are waking up to the extent to which Brexit, the far right, neoliberalism and ultra-conservatism are anti-women policies. But if you're a female academic, as in the case of my friend Charlotte Galpin and my friend Amelia Hatfield and my friend Roberta Garina, don't say this. Because if you do, you will be persecuted in national newspapers. You will need to change your telephone number, your email address. You will be slaughtered on social media forever. And your lives will be questioned, if not put into threat. So the takeaway from all of this is that we can't just study the rise of the far right. We need to think about how it's networked with particular ultra-conservatives and neoliberal networks, which weaken de democratic politics. We need to understand that lack of knowledge provides a fertile ground, leaving voters vulnerable to false claims and the seductions of far-right simplicity. The disinformation spread by ultra-conservative and neoliberal networks, which fund and gather data in order to destabilize democracy and spread this propaganda, are accentuated through media lies, which fail to present objectively both public and private, social and traditional media. And this leads to and accentuates patterns of toxic masculinity, which silence female politicians and experts through threat uh, assessments and uh, uh, approaches. In all, we need in here in Sweden, and I say the word we, speaking now as a Swedish uh, citizen, we need to be aware that this is already going on in Sweden and it runs the risk of, um, in the run into the European Parliament elections, not necessarily, I hope, leading to the same sort of British catastrophe, but we do need to wake up before it's too late. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, I would like to uh, use my position here to ask some questions, but please prepare uh, any question. Uh, we have some minutes left. I would like to ask, during this last uh, mandate uh, period in Sweden, uh, the Sverigedemokraterna clearly took a stand before there might have been some insecurity on whether they were a left or right mm. kind of party. Uh, but could you um, compare the situation? It, it comes down to a simple question of uh, how we fund how schools are being funded, or mm. public, uh, what we call it, offentlig verksamhet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it uh, went all the way into the Arbetsgivarföreningen, mm. uh, but also magazines in Sweden linked to the industrial organizations. Uh, what would you say, is, there, is this in alignment with the same uh, development as in uh, the UK? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're not exactly comparing like with like. On the other hand, UKIP makes the same sorts of claims that we need to leave the EU in order to restore um, investment in our public services and the constant references to the National Health Service. It's worth remembering the first time we heard vote no or it will destroy the National Health Service was during the AV referendum in 2011. So this is a, fa a familiar trope. Um, of conservative forces trying to press buttons, any button, interestingly, that would provide them with support. Um, ultimately, the risk is, of course, that if you expose yourself to wider market forces, as Britain will now do, um, there is no public services, particularly health services, because as we already know from the report last week, the US negotiating position is public procurement um, uh, offers within the UK will have to be open to US firms. Mm -hmm. In some respects, this is already happening in social services and child protection, mm -hmm. but this will accentuate. The same is true in Sweden. It's irrespective of what was the case prior to membership. Now, if Sweden leaves the EU, it's quite clear it will need to open up, if it's to have similar types of trade deals or better trade deals with non-EU states, it will have to open it up in its public procurement and public service industries to competition by outside providers. So whatever one says about uh, the necessity to vote for me because I will protect your health, your social, your education services, the reality is, is if you push an exposure to wider market forces outside the EU, you're basically kissing your public services goodbye. Mm. Yeah. Uh, particularly, and the added feature, and this is why the, the Labour position is so hopeless, is if your economy tanks at the same time, um, and the UK economy has already tanked, mm. a 2% GNP GDP loss over two years is just the worst imaginable, you will never have the money to support your public services. And, as in the case of Jeremy Corbyn, you will never be able to afford to buy back rail. So what would you say, does this um, create a conflict within this conservative, ultra-conservative group within the uh, EU, that the, the Swedish, Sw Swedish Democrats, Sverigedemokraterna, for instance, just decided to skip uh, the demand of leaving yeah, the Union? Yeah, that's right. I, well, I think this is exactly what you're seeing. It's a very interesting shift within right-wing groups across uh, the European Parliament, where you've now seen a movement away from the demand for a, a Swexit debate or a, a, a Daskit debate, you know, and, and the idea that, well, we can get the Europe we want within the EU. And so Poland, Hungary, Italy, you know, uh, and other far-right groups basically are now saying that, well, you know, uh, as Ricard was saying in the introduction, if we just get rid of certain clauses like the necessity for solidarity and the idea of having a common migration policy, uh, and then weaken, if not shatter, the euro, uh, then we've got the Europe we want, basically. And the answer from UKIP? Uh, the answer from UKIP came yesterday because most leading UKIP members were in Italy and Poland mm. trying to get their governments to not agree to an extension. Now, you know, I don't like to use words like treason, but going to foreign governments to get them to do something that's against the interests of your government is borderline, you know, uh, basically trying to use your far-right network, which is now very well developed, mm. as we've seen, to undermine your parliament. Mm. 
And ultimately, one of the goals of far-right parties is to switch the actually existing representative democracy for direct democracy, the dream of tyranny across the world. I do have another question, but maybe I should uh, open up. <laughs> well, maybe I have my question. Okay. What would you, <laughs> what would you say is... Uh, there was in Sweden. There was quite a big interest of the European Union when we had the election in, uh, back in the well last cycle. Uh, but immediately afterwards, the media interest it just fell. And uh, we, our magazine have tried to put these questions at front, but it's really, really difficult, and the knowledge is as you say, very low in these questions. What would you say is this extreme lack of interest from uh, media? Mm. You see that in the information, the data that I demonstrated. The spike in 2014 in knowledge is linked to the European Parliament debates. Um, uh, and, and so you see a pattern of spiking every time there's a European Parliament election. The great challenge, I think, for media and for political parties and interested citizens who want to sustain and support democracy is how do you go beyond the spike related to European Parliament elections and improve general levels of knowledge about the EU? I, I think this starts with education across the board. It starts with having a public service requirement for news organisations to um, present information about the EU. Uh, and I think in particular it does something that, that social media has the potential to do, but doesn't, which is present stories from other countries that show a different light on the EU and your own country. Mm. Um, which I think all is easily possible within existing legal frameworks. But people don't do, I think, for the idea that the EU isn't that interesting. Now, the astonishing thing in the UK is nobody had any interest whatsoever. In the 2010 election yeah. in the U UK, uh, Europe came 10th in terms of interest. Now, Brexit is uh, a fascinating inversion of this. Mm. You can't talk about anything else. Government hasn't done anything else for two and a half years. It's Brexit, Brexit, Brexit every day and will be for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, it, you know, if you're not interested in the EU, you should be because it will be interested in you if you come any closer to crashing out and trashing your economy and society. But we also, we've all seen these uh, national leaders, prime ministers, going back to their own country, mm. saying that they, it, the, 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 the negotiations were a success. Uh, but it also tells a story about me media being very nationalistic in its mm -hmm. founding, so to speak. Yeah. Do you see any um, change in this field? <laughs> Positive change? As I said, potentially social media and transnational media have the, the possibility to see other medias and to see how um, in particular, the story told in national medias is often a very nationalistic mm. story. Mm. Yeah? But there's a, a second problem behind that, which is that traditional media is in absolute crisis. You know, the independent Britain's only cent centrist newspaper is now online only. The, the Guardian has now managed to change its, its funding model, but is always at risk. Um, so the number of dedicated journalists that follow the EU is, is at best one if not none, in many countries across the EU, which means that you kind of get a Stockholm view of what the EU mm. might be. Mm. You know, very rarely do you have journalists that are down there, not just following the European Council story, you know, or the Juncker story, but following what's actually going on beneath the surface. Mm. And so th then when you have, for instance, is gender policy within the EU good for you or bad for you? And, and instead of going, well, yeah, yeah, you know, it's a little bit, yeah, but maybe it's best, you know, that we do away with maternity and paternity leave, you know, and just go back to the good old days. Mm. You're at least in a posi position to know, or uh, although it wasn't debated at the European Council, there are very strong EU positions on mm. this. Okay. Lots of bad news, and uh, <laughs> now we're going to have some more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ian Manners. Uh,